morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for joining this next session uh, on the Executive MBA uh, Consortium Global Programme. My name is David Oglethorpe, and I am the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of the Cranfield School of Management in the UK. So greetings from the UK. I hope that everyone is safe and well um, in these continually challenging times. Um, I'm running the session for now. Uh, so you've got me for the next half hour to 45 minutes. Uh, my colleague, Christy McRindle, is uh, in the background and will be looking at questions as they arise. So please use the, the question function and we'll get some Q&A at the end. Um, there is also a document that's been uh, I've made available for this session I'll refer to later. If you look into the um, session information tab on the right hand side of the, the of the on air platform, you'll find that information. Um, it's a case study that we're not actually going to work through, but I will refer to it. Um, so I am Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of Cranfield School of Management, but I'm also an environmental economist. And what environmental economists do is to put values on the environment. Um, on particularly on non-traded goods and services. So most goods and services are traded in markets and they, they therefore get a, a revealed price on them in that marketplace. But non-traded goods and services, environmental goods and services, such as clean air, clean water, landscapes, um, the sorts of uh, nature and la that we, we enjoy and we consume actually don't have, aren't necessarily traded. Um, and it's important we put values on these environmental goods and services for, for two, two reasons that are relevant to business. And one is um, that environmental damage attracts litigation and fines. Um, and, you need to, and, and the litigation needs to know how much those fines should be. And polluters have to pay those fines. On the other side, then providers of environmental goods and services can get benefits, uh, are delivering benefits to society. So we need to know how to price up uh, those environmental credentials of products that might be, um, that we might deliver. So what my focus is today, I'm gonna to now share my screen and um, uh, begin the presentation. And what I'm talking about today is, is uh, the connection here between Kuznets and COVID-19. A lot of the presentations you've received in the last few days have, have obviously got a COVID-19 flavour. Um, and what is a Kuznet, I hear you say? Well, Kuznets is, is Kuznets theory is what I'm referring to, and I'll explain that in a short period of time. But it was named after Simon Kuznets, who was actually um, an economics scholar from Harvard who won the Nobel Prize for Economics for this theory in, in the 1970s. And what I'm going to try and look at is whether there could be actually any some environmental economic value in the global pandemic. It seems a bit perverse, uh, but I'll look at what the theory says about this and then how we might actually go about working what, out what that value might be. So if we, if we think about what's going on at the moment, we've got this, this is a fairly unkind uh, cartoon in a, in a UK newspaper, but um, you know, we have this wave of COVID um, that has come towards us and that is resurging in many countries as well. Behind it, we will face an economic recession globally, without a doubt, it's already starting in many countries. But looming in the background and always was looming in the background is a huge climate change agenda, which could affect business uh, more than anything else, in fact, in, in years to come. So what, um, what we've all noticed, I think, through the, the COVID pandemic, I mean, the initial, obviously, the thing that we immediately noticed was there's a huge lockdown everywhere. And we get pictures from all over the globe of parked up aeroplanes, empty motorways, um, the price of oil basically falling to zero and, and the demand for energy falling off a cliff edge. So that graph in the top right hand corner is the energy demand in northern Italy following lockdown and huge reductions in transport, land and air and in energy use across the globe. If we think about that in relation to any country's greenhouse gas targets and where we're, many countries are signed up to the Paris and Kyoto protocols, 
and the Paris Agreement subsequently. Um, this is where the UK is, and the UK has been, been doing okay in terms of its environmental cleanup and its, its achievement of its greenhouse gas targets. And many countries have as well. They followed a trajectory which has taken them down, particularly in the renewables energy sector, some way towards hitting their, their, their carbon uh, targets. Where we were going from here, though, we're not, we were never really clear. A lot of the low hanging fruit on, on um, climate change targets had actually been achieved through the likes of renewable energy. And the next steps in, in climate change targets and greenhouse gas targets um, were less certain. But if we, if we were looking, that's where the UK was before uh, the, the pandemic started. Um, and it's, the, the achievement is still quite significant. We need to be doing 3.3 million tonnes of carbon equivalents a year better than we are doing at the moment. It's taking off the equivalent of sizable mileages off every car, or actually the equivalent of um, someone uh, of, of 316 car miles every second. So it's, it's not an inconsiderable amount per person when you come down to this and the effort that's required. But in terms of what's happened over the, the pandemic, simply by taking out the aviation that we've seen stop and taking out half the surface transport in the UK, this is what is likely to have happened to the carbon impact and the greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. We've gone across the trend line and we're way ahead of target. So that, that sounds good. That sounds really good. Immediately we think we've got an environmental benefit from COVID. When everything else is so gloomy and lots of eco and, and economic recession from COVID, we know um, there have been flu fewer planes in the sky. We know air quality has improved. We know noise pollution has improved. And so there it is. That's, that's where, that's where it's, we're likely to see the climate change targets uh, be recorded in the next year as we come out of this. Our question is though, will it just bounce back post COVID? Will we just see an emergence of industry, an emergence of aviation, a re-emergence and us going back over the line? Well, clearly what we should be doing as a society and across economies and within business is trying to regrow without that happening. And this is what we hear about in terms of green growth. But let me just say, let me just try and explain that with a bit of a bit of theory. And this is where uh, Simon Kuznets comes back in, our Harvard uh, professor. Um, Simon Kuznets developed this developed uh, development theory in the, in the 70s. And basically, the, the, it's a very simplistic view, I think, of what Kuznets developed here. But basically what Kuznets said was, look, there's over the spectrum of a nation's growth. So as it develops its economy, Gross domestic product per capita rises, but income inequality at first becomes worse. And then the economy gets better at, at equalizing income through the internalization of things such as health and welfare systems, education, and so forth. So at first we might have agrarian systems on the bottom left-hand corner there, which as, as industries, sorry, as, as countries go through their industrial revolutions, they start to climb that curve and they become the most polluting, uh, sorry, they become the, the most income inequality countries, but then they become better at actually distributing, redistributing that income around through such things as health, welfare and education. Environmental economists got hold of this theory and said, actually, look, the same might be the case for environmental impact. So as a, an economy develops, it's got a really low environmental um, impact when we just got agricultural systems. As those countries go through their industrial revolutions, they start to pollute. But as they become more sophisticated and become slightly richer and able to uh, uh, internalize some of those environmental impacts, then it starts to fall, fall over as uh, it starts to, to reduce again. And this is this has largely been proven as uh, a holding relationship as economies go through a growth process, they increase environmental impact and then it falls off again. And whether the curve is actually that neat uh, is, is a moot point and uh, up for discussion. So what would happen um, uh, with COVID-19? 
Well, what we first get, as I said, is a shock environmental improvement. With sudden lockdown everywhere, we get a sudden cessation of transport, of energy use, uh, and so on. Um, but then we will get an economic recession. So if we were to look on this line and think, well, what, how will that line move as a consequence of COVID? It depends where we, where we start. So what's going to happen to the environmental Kuznets curve? If we were over here, then we're on the trajectory going up. And if we're over here, we're on the trajectory coming down with environmental impact. But in both cases, we'd start off with this shock environmental improvement. So let's say we're over here. We would see immediately a major environmental disruption. We'd move down from that point. If we we're over on this side, again, we'd move down. There'd be a reduction in environmental impact or an environmental saving, if you like. If that's followed by a major economic disruption and recession, in fact, we will start to move to the left. And we might move to the left by a percentage across, across the world, but that percentage in absolute terms will actually be greater on higher GDP per capita countries than on lower ones. So we'll get a absolute terms, lower increase, uh, decrease on the left there. So if we were to do that across all points, what we'd actually get as the global economy shrinks, so does its environmental impact. So, so there is always going to be an environmental benefit from recession. Uh, an interesting fact, uh, an interesting outcome that is, isn't often explored because no one wants to explore recession as a way of achieving environmental gains. The key question is though, if we are here, if we've now moved to a smaller inset uh, environmental Kuznets curve, so what? What, what, do we, what do we do about that? Um, well, we've been talking about green growth for years. And what we clearly need to do is to get economic growth back without re-increasing that environmental impact. So let's go back to the curve. What we would really want to do going forward and making sure we develop new systems and whatever the new normal is, we develop business practices and economic systems that actually recreate that. That is what we would call green growth. So growing back to the same levels of GDP per capita, but without making the same level of environmental impact. So the question is, now that sounds fine in terms of our, a theoretical concept, that sounds fine, it sounds sensible, it sounds like, well, yeah, that's the path we should be taking. But how do we do that? Because at the moment, all the value in the markets that we see would take us back onto the top trajectory. They would take us back onto the original line because the markets are set up to motivate and to give reward to an increasing environmental impact and high industrial um, productivity. So what? So again, what we need to do then, what we need to think about is creating value from that in environmental saving as we grow, regrow the economy. If we go back to what the purpose of environmental economists is, that means finding ways of finding value in products, so adding to market value as a consequence of their environmental credentials, or finding value in public good. So in the benefits that, the, the global benefits and the common benefits that are provided by such things as cleaner air and, and cleaner water and so on, uh, attaching values to that and making sure that, that those the value that's of, and worth that's in that goes to the right people so that the incentives for economic development change. So how do we find out how much it's worth? And that's really the, the, the groundwork of environmental economists. Um, finding out how much the environment is actually worth so we can put it into those values in products or recognise that value in public goods and internalise that into our policy decision making and our business decision making. So just, just to turn back to some of the principles of, of the theory here there, you know, is the reduction in environmental impact actually worth anything? Well, yes, it is, because what we, what we refer to as any, any un, unintended consequence of market activity is actually called a market externality. Many of you who study economics will be familiar with this. An environmental externality is an unintended consequence of market activity on the environment. 
Um, really familiar example here is that we we uh, we end up when we have unreg unregulated access to sea fishing, we lead to depletion in fish stock fish stocks, and it's what's known as the tragedy of the commons. When we all have access to natural resources and there's no regulation of that, we overuse them. Um, having common access is a wonderful thing, but the tragedy of it, tragedy of it is that we overuse them. So we, but we can have positive environmental externalities which improve your welfare, uh, such as um, you know, we, we do put values on um, having nice landscapes to walk around, having national parks, um, having uh, good environmental uh, conditions to, to, to exist in. Um, we have things such as campaigns around save the whale, for example. You may never see a whale, but you're interested in, it, in saving it, and that improves your welfare. We have negative externalities, which basically put, reduce your, your welfare, such as pollution. So naturally, you may think, well, this is a bit like um, uh, COVID itself. In having, when you have a, an endemic disease in a population, you think the natural response is to reduce that to zero and actually the the veterinary the veterinary or the health professional response is to reduce it reduce it to zero but if that costs something in fact there will be an economic optimum there always is an economic optimum so we might think let's just introduce mandatory laws and policies to get rid of next negative externalities but it's not as simple as that there has to be value involved value attached because like any good service, there's going to be an optimum. So, and also, as I said, we need to be able to ha know how to respond to things and how to litigate against such things as the Exxon Valdez or the Gulf of Mexico. The Exxon Valdez was a major uh, a ship which um, created a major oil spill in the 1970s. And actually it was through the litigation that was required then where environmental economics was born as a discipline. But if we have, um, we have damage that is going to be caused to the environment, but we have a desire to clean that damage up. We actually have a concept of marginal damage curves, like we might have in supply and demand for in economic goods and services. And we have abatement curves as well. So we have the value that people see in improving um, the environment, and we have the cost that we see in creating that environmental improvement. So the first units of any negative externality or any environmental damage created are typically at low levels. But as they become, um, as we want to, to, to reduce more and more negative externality or environmental damage, it costs us more and more cumulatively. And we get an exponentially increasing total damage curve. So to get rid of the very last unit, of an environmental negative externality, it costs us a lot of money. And we have an upward sloping marginal damage curve. That's the marginal change across as we move along that upward sloping uh, damage curve. By the same token, if we want to reduce negative externalities, someone has to pay for that. So we have abatement costs. The first unit, in almost exactly the same way, the first units of negative uh, externality abatement are relatively cheap. It's easy to clean up at first and take the low hanging fruit, but the more and more we want to clean up, the cost increases and increases. So if we get to a, a low levels of negative externality, so high levels of abatement, we've got a very high cost. So we have an exponentially increasing total abatement cost curve and a downward sloping marginal abatement cost curve. Now the economists of you know where this is going. Um, marginal cost equals marginal revenue is where the, re the equilibrium is. Marginal abatement cost and marginal damage curve, where they cross over, that's where the optimum is. If we wanted this very, uh, if, if there was zero uh, a cost attached, sorry, to a negative externality, uh, polluters will just won't abate and they'll create um, N1, huge amount of pollution. This is basic market failure and it'll cost C1 a huge amount to society. But similarly, if we wish damage, damage to be zero, that's gonna create huge high abatement costs, the same as at C1. So the social and public and private optimum 
is where that marginal abatement cost and marginal damage cost overlap. Now we can find out what marginal abatement cost can be to any business. We, if we know what the, um, the costs of production are and we know which, which uh, processes in that, in that production process lead to pollution, we can work out how to reduce the supply of pollution from a particular process. So we would look at marginal abatement cost curves from the private cost, from the cost of the supplier, the person who's going to create the environmental improvement. So that would we would we would work that out from firm level data. But we need but in terms of working out how much people are willing to pay or how much we would we could charge for the damage, uh, we have to start looking at more uh, at valuing the environment and looking at non-market valuation methods. And we generally follow two principles here. One is that we're going to make someone um, we're going to give someone some money to create an environmental improvement or we're going to tax someone who actually pollutes the environment. So the provider gets or the polluter pays. But to put a value on either, we need to know what society would be willing to pay to provide that environmental benefit so we can pay, provide, pay the provider. Or how much they'd be willing to accept in compensation for, as an environmental cost so we know how much to tax the polluter. So it's important that we know how much in, in all of this. And that's about trying to create uh, and find the actual curve of the, uh, the marginal, sorry, the damage curve. But given these are non-market traded goods and services, we're not gonna just go to a market and find what the market price is. We need different vehicles of, of, asking, of ways of asking people how much they'd be willing to pay. It's, what, it's what's called stated preference rather than revealed preference, which is market prices. So the, the, the link that I talked about before is actually a case study for Norwegian shipping. And it gives you an example of a method called contingent valuation. And contingent valuation is a way of just of simply revealing the stated preference of, of uh, through a survey of, of people about how much they'd be willing to pay to protect the environment. And I'm, I'm, I've not got time to go through the case study, but if you read that document, you'll see how the Norwegian public were challenged with, uh, through a series of questions about how much to be willing to pay for, for increasing levels of environmental damage caused by Norwegian shipping. Now, the Norwegian government were going to use that information to work out a, a policy for how they would clean up the shipping industry. So in the coffee time, please do have a look at that and have a think about, if you can, in groups, about what you think you might be willing to pay for these different levels of environmental damage. I can say that having done this already with MBA students, uh, I, create, I recreated that uh, session uh, a while ago with some MBA students. And here were the actual results from, from Norway. Um, the legend actually refers to different Norwegian regions. So the lead blue line is the region where most of the shipping activity was around coastal regions was impacting. But the, the other regions were um, areas away from the coast. So obviously they might have had different damage functions. But you can see here through a series of four points, we've got four points on a linear segmented damage curve. I did exactly the same experiment with MBA students and this is the damage curve that we got. So as you can see, you can reveal through a very simple questionnaire um, an aggregate damage curve, which we could then take into our uh, analysis of what the optimum is in terms of environmental improvement. So we overlay that damage curve. So that was a group of MBA students in the UK um, following that case study. And this is where we came up with we overlay the costs associated with that taken from the shipping industry in the Norwegian example, um, then we would work out what is the optimum cleanup rate. So we would know how much that was worth and we know how much it would cost. If you take a slightly larger scale here, um, Bob Costanza in the, um, in the late 90s, and he tried this again in 2014, tried to put a value on the world's global ecosystem services. Um, huge task and there was a large group i'd say costanza et al there was about 20 environmental economists involved in this and but he was trying to do this he did it in 97 and then um, in 2014 
basically to say, look, using the same methodology, whether you believe in the methodology he used in the first place, using the same methodology, had there been degradation in global ecosystems? And yes, there'd been uh, a, a, a reduction uh, down 20 trillion since 1997 using the same method. Now, the method he used here was largely benefits transfer, which is where you take, you take evidence from previous studies and you overlay that into the context of the study site that you're interested in. So it's, uh, if you are interested in this, go and look up on benefits transfer. It's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the main method where we're able to aggregate some large scale environmental costs and services. But this is the sort of thing that environmental economics can do and the sort of thing that we should be doing, I think, in response to COVID. And it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge about where we could go now. On a slightly larger scale, again, de Groot et al, and again, it was a large group of environmental economists, have produced something like, um, uh, well, using a huge amount of data, over 1,350 estimates coded across uh, a whole bunch of you know, hundreds of different previous environmental studies have put a ticket price almost on some of the specific ecosystems that we see across the world. So if you were to try and estimate what the environmental damage would be to uh, of a particular phenomenon like COVID, then you need to look at how many uh, how many coastal wetlands have been impacted? Um, or if you were looking at um, the Exxon Valdez, for example, um, how much uh, how much of the wetland was impacted? How much um, sea life was affected? What what was the impact on coral reefs and so on? Um, and they've done this across a whole range of other ecosystem services, such as air, water, and so on. So back to COVID and back to that improvement in the UK. How much might that be worth and how might it, it might even continue? Well, just to take one very simple benefits transfer approach. If we took out the removal of aviation and half surface transport, as I did before, that's actually a saving of 80,000 million tonnes of carbon equivalents. That's what that blue line dropping over the, the brown line is. If we would take a very simple unit benefits transfer for air pollution and for uh, to, to measure the value in that drop in the blue line, then we need to go and look at um, some, some estimated benefits of clean air. And the Grantham Institute have made this estimate of local air pollution benefits across various countries. And it can vary, uh, it tends to be average in the range of 50 uh, to 100 dollars per tonne of CO2. So the figure for the UK um, is on that on that graph is 175 to 255 dollars per ton of carbon equivalent. If we think that that's, we've got 80 million tons, then actually that works out something between 14 billion to 20.4 billion just for, just in the UK just for that air pollution increase. If we were to widen that out globally. If we were to widen that out against other environmental benefits, such as noise, water, other things across the supply chain, and start to count up across lots of ecosystem services about the benefits of those reductions in environmental damage, where might we get to? Well, maybe Bob Costanza wasn't wrong about his uh, 125 trillion reduction um, in ecosystem services. It's possible we might have got some of that back. But the big question here, and this is where I'm going to leave it for, for uh, open up to Q and A's, but leave you with a, quite a contentious question. We know that this environmental benefit has been delivered by, as I say, removal of aviation, half surface transport, huge costs to the airline industries, but the airline industries have actually provided us with this environmental saving. Should we be paying the airlines for this benefit? If, if we were following the theory, we would say that if we're able to internalize an environmental externality and there's a value to that, we should be paying the provider of that benefit. Now, one could say, well, we were already paying, we we're already um, making the polluter pay for the environmental damage they were creating before. 
But there's a question here, I think, uh, about the benefit that the global, global economy might get in a non-market sense from environmental benefit and who should be the recipient of that if we were able to internalize it. Partly an academic question, but it's also something that perhaps is realistic uh, uh, as we emerge from, from COVID. So I'll leave it there. I'm going to say thank you and I'm going to um, see if we can answer any questions or actually if you've got any answers yourselves. And um, I'll hand over to Christy now who might just uh, be able to summarise any of the questions that we might have for us. Thank you. Hello David, thank you for that. Um, so the first question comes in from Ilan Levi. So his question is, taking into consideration social distance rules, do you expect more pollution impact since transportation overall will be less efficient, i.e. fewer passengers per, pl per plane? Also, how can we mitigate this impact? I'm going to stop sharing my presentation so I, can, I definitely come up on the screen, but that's a brilliant question, actually. Um, and it hits right at the heart of some of the things that environmental economists have to grapple with because the the popularist answer isn't necessarily the answer in terms of environmental improvement. Um, the question, the question, I'll come back discreetly to the question in a moment, but a few years ago there was a big um, debate around mooch, trying to switch over to localised food systems, particularly in Europe. It was a big movement towards localised food systems. And if you purposefully dismantle economies of scale in economic systems, all you create is replication. So in fact, with the, the food, the local food agenda was all built around this notion of food miles. And actually by increasing the amount of local food consumption rather than centralized consolidated consumption and distribution, you increase the environmental impact, you increase the number of journeys being made. And that's exactly what this question is. If we need more journeys because fewer people can fit in planes, um, or fewer people can fit in cars or on buses or and so on we may well see the the number of journeys increasing it's an obvious solution so in fact we might actually see greater environmental impact from covid simply because of social distancing rules uh, how we might mitigate that i think um there are two answers to this one is what environmental economists are supposed to actually do is to present this as a problem and then we should be seeking technological solutions to it. So I made myself quite unpopular once with the, um, the local food agenda um, by saying that actually what we need are bigger supermarkets, bigger distribution centres, more centralisation because that actually brings down the reduction in the food miles. And in fact, the, so in fact scale is an answer to this. In terms of mitigating this, we need, if we need to reduce journeys, then we probably need to utilise bigger vehicles. You know, we, um, we're facing an issue, all the universities are facing an issue in terms of the, the, the fixed stock of lecture rooms that they have and the need to reduce capacity. So, so more repeat teaching um, or online teaching. So systems have to change and scale has to change. Okay, uh, next question comes from Marcelo. Oliveira, recession may also delay the adoption of costly energy alternatives. Wouldn't it be the case of recession leading to a greater environmental impact in some cases and countries? Yes, um, Marcelo, thank you. I mean, that's uh, it's sort of uh, that's part of the tragedy of the commons is that, in fact, and the combination that what we have here is environmental degradation sorry, environmental improvements, but economic degradation. Um, and the fact that no one can necessarily afford the environmental improvements that we want. Um, so this is where a huge amount of political and economic foresight needs to be had in looking really far forward and saying, look, actually now is the time to invest in that green growth. Now is the time to continue to, to invest in those green technologies um, and prioritizing green growth. Um, I think, I mean, I, th I think you're making a statement there as much as a question. I think you're absolutely right. Okay, so next question, next question comes from Jesse Hurst. 
So not all countries want to or are able to prioritise green growth measures post-COVID. How do we mitigate this, the desperate approaches that will be followed? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if, you, if you go back to that Kuznets diagram, you think about the red dotted line that I, I, I um, created, there is still an upward slope on the left hand side of that red dotted line. So it, it, we have to recognize that there are still economies that need to grow by producing pollution to get to the point at which they can then start to reduce pollution. So I, there is, as part of the development of any country, there has to be an industrialization uh, and we have to have an acceptance that those countries are able to, to um, go through that. And there is, a, there is a certain amount of hypocrisy I think we see um, from Western governments particularly say, who um, were able to go through their industrial revolutions and creating pollution without the developing nations being allowed to. But it's the, it's, it's the tolerance on how much pollution um, is where we have to get to, I think. Okay, um, the next question comes from Major Norwakosa. I hope I've said that, said that right. So the Kuznet curve is very theoretical. US is the best example that it gets distorted by politics and particular groups of interests. Do you really believe that achieving the global equilibrium is possible? <laughs> in theory <laughs> I think what it was it, it, it is the Kuznets curve is very theoretical and I was laying out you know, the theory what the theory says and what should be, be possible we know how we can put values on the environment um, I, I I think you know you're, the, the, the issue here is that it's a highly political a highly political system um, or a system being that requires highly political consensus. But if you think how things have changed and the summit in Davos this year was, um, I mean, bizarre in that it happened a week before, pretty much before global lockdown. It happened um, the week before the WHO recognised uh, COVID as a global pandemic. Um, but global business leaders and politicians were coming to listen to Greta Thunberg. They were coming to, and they were talking about the environment. And they were, for the first time at that summit, it wasn't just about economic growth. And even though we can be cynical about uh, certain political leaders and bombastic political leaders, um, there is a changing, there is definitely a changing mood amongst that community, amongst that elite business and political community that has shifted so whether i believe it or not it is we can observe it um it happening okay so next question comes from henrik maciel david regarding the food mile system it makes sense that scale reduces environmental impact resulting from fossil fruit fossil fuel use but does that model incorporate other environmental damages from food production, e.g. heavy use of pesticides and associated diseases? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question because it's, uh, what that challenges is the dimensions that you look at in terms of environmental damage. And, and that was the unfortunate issue with the food miles debate that they focused on carbon. And carbon equates to fuel use, basically. And, as, and every, you know, the logical answer around scale is that the more miles you can get out of every litre of fuel, the better. And um, scale leads to that conclusion. But, but it was looking at it in one dimension. And if you start to look at other dimensions, such as um, health and welfare, um, uh, other aspects of the environment to do with uh, bees and pollination and growth of, of wild crops and things like that, and all of the other ecosystems that, that I was talking about before, of course, it becomes a multi-dimensional problem. And as soon as you, you you squeeze one end of the balloon, the other end pops out, and that's that's a real challenge um, for both for academics and for policymakers, and for business analysts as well. Is to uh, we we hear about the triple bottom line and making sure that we're taking economic, environmental, and social aspects into account. But even each of those has many different. Um, uh, components to it. Uh, I would direct you to a, a paper I wrote a few years ago, which was in a journal called Environmental Planning A, which tried to take a pragmatic um, approach to taking five key variables that might be of interest 
um, across environment and across economy and society and how we might juggle those and come to a solution based on different priorities. But again, the, the optimum outcome becomes almost an ethical issue that's a consequence of someone's preferences rather than it being black and white about the economic value in it. So, um, uh, yes, it's it, pesticide use and so on. That, that's where we might see, start to see some economic value in organic production, for example. People might not be able, may, people may not be prepared to pay for the additional uh, taste, for example, in organics. And there's not proved that there is any more nutritional value but organic systems rule out pesticides and herbicides and so on. And so it becomes a lifestyle choice. Okay, so next question comes from Namawanda Blossom. Green aviation seems to be the solution as social distancing will result in more flights with fewer passengers. Do you know how much of this innovation is currently being explored? Yes, um, well, lots of it at Cranfield actually. Um, much of it, uh, I'm not allowed to know <laughs> about, but uh, there's there's significant um, innovation going on in Cranfield into um, hydrogen fuel cells and the use of um, use of those in aviation. And uh, I know that the experiments that are going on that are incredibly um, uh, confidential at the moment actually uh, are leading to some dramatic changes that I think we can see in terms of the the aviation sector. Okay, so next question comes from Anastasios. Are you aware of any research carried out to measure the anticipated environmental impact of remote working, especially in the winter of 2020-21? For example, due to increased heating or electricity needs? Yeah, it's. There, I mean, there's two things. Two things here, which is which are interesting. From an environmental economics point of view, it, it's the trade-off between heating at home versus heating in the workplace, and how much. <clears throat> but but the, I think the interesting thing is who's paying for it. Um, you know, we've seen um, schemes that have been made available by the government to aid home working um, in terms of the the facilities you have and the. <clears throat> the IT that you might equip yourself with, but that needs to, that's going to have to turn to how much you're going to have to heat your home more to be in it. Um, I think it's a really interesting question and who should pay for that uh, and and um, whether the overall environmental impact will go down. It's a huge amount to do with if we see workplaces, people returning to workplaces and those workplaces having to be fully heated then the environmental impact is going to go up because because we're going to have both the workplace and the home environment heated uh, and energy use and more cooking at home and all of that kind of thing. Okay, um, so next question comes from Paul Thomas and the time has been extended for, by a further five minutes, just to let everybody know. So um, this is to do with the HS2 project, which is obviously big in the UK right now. So what alternatives to HS2 investment would be feasible to satisfy economic slash employment whilst pres preserving the natural habitat or what's left of it? Um, Paul is not a tree hugger per se, but recognises that we have discriminate, discriminated many of our natural resources. Yes, I mean, there, there will be policies in place. So we have... Um, uh, we we do we do have policies in the UK that deal with the the replacement of landscape and so on and <clears throat> the government actually very much follows the the provider gets policy here so when that HS2 line goes through farmland for example um, the re landscaping and the re, re the repairing of that that land um, will probably attract grants such as the grants are approved before between the environmental impact, uh, sorry, the environmental um, uh, sensitive areas scheme and so on. Um, uh, so yes, and I'm, I'm, I think I, I'm not a tree hugger either, but there is an economic value in environmental benefit and part of the budget with HS2, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure has an environmental restoration such as it would with open, um, open cast 
um, mining. I have a feeling we're about to be closed down here. Uh, they have ex we have had our time extended for five minutes. Okay, I thought D David seemed to be signalling to us that uh, something was was over. Oh, but, okay. Uh, oh no, we're still going. Brilliant. We're still going. Yeah, we just got one last question from Michael Flamengo. So, um, do you think, as a society, we are focusing more strongly towards um, CO two emissions instead of focusing on more other well, on other types of environmental pollution, such as chemical, nuclear waste problems, and ocean pollution? Yes, I do. I do. I think this is part of the triple bottom line, um, multi multi factor problem that we face. Um, I think. I think. I think as a society, and as policymakers, they've got their heads around CO two. It's always contentious because it's it's driven by the climate change agenda, but um, a huge problem down the line is is water and water availability and access to clean water uh, across the globe is is the next problem that we're really going to um, face. And um, well, we and we hear all the time about plastics in oceans and so on, but uh, these are these are hugely significant problems. That, create, that, are, that require a huge amount of cleanup to happen. Um, again, there'll be costs associated with that, but um, I think hopefully what I've shown is that economies and societies have to be prepared to pay for that, for it to actually happen. Uh, otherwise, we, we will continue to pollute and damage the environment. Okay, that's all questions. I think that's it. I think we're, we're out of questions. Um, can I say again that uh, uh, I hope everyone is safe and well and um, continue on with uh, this journey, this excellent programme that's been put together. Um, and I hope you're enjoying everything and uh, enjoy your coffee break and see if you can come up with a value for those Norwegian shippers. Goodbye. <laughs>